Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up in the back of the room if you can hear me fine. Great. Um, my name is Mark Mentel. Um, I'm a family doctor who practices here locally. I'm part of the faculty with Family Medicine Residency of Western Montana. Um, I have a problem with saying no, so I happen to say yes, so I also happen to be the person who was chosen as the chairperson for planning this year's Montana Patient Initiative Conference. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, I am proud to present uh, the seventh biannual Pain Initiative Conference. This year's theme is Pain is Inevitable, Suffering is Optional, an Ethical Approach to Managing Pain. Before I delve uh, into how I came to this title, how we came to this title as a planning committee, I'd like to thank the following individuals. Um, first, I'd like to thank Western Montana AHEC, the American Cancer Society, and the American Cancer Society Action Network for promoting this event. Montana Medical Association and the American Cancer Society Action Network for hosting this evening's community conversation, which I'm hoping a majority of you will be uh, there in attendance. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge Dean, Dean Reed Humphrey with the College of Health Professions and Biomedical Sciences at the University of Montana, along with Scott Wittenberg, Vice President of Research at the University of Montana for continued support of AHEC and its mission. I'd like to thank Millennium Health uh, for sponsoring tomorrow's lunch with, with a presentation on medication monitoring. I'd like to thank each one of the committee members who spent uh, and sacrificed much of their time and offered uh, significant professional guidance in planning this conference. Um, Leanne Bradley, uh, PharmD with Montana Pain and Spine. Jean Branscombe, CEO of Montana Medical Association. Carrie Haney, PharmD, University of Montana, Family Medicine Residency of Western Montana. Anita Harper Poe with Garlington, Lone, and Robinson, specializing in healthcare law. John Miller, MD, Medical Director of Partnership Health Center and faculty with Family Medicine Residency of Western Montana. Kristen Page Nye with the American Cancer Society. Jen Robom, PhD, Behavioral Science, University of Montana, Family Medicine Residency of Western Montana and Linda Torma, who has the longest title at the end that I think we have of anyone, PhD, MSN, APRN, BC at Montana State University. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the organizational staff, Sarah Laney, Martha Robertson, and Robin Mokey, without whose vigilance and organizational skills, I don't think this would be possible. Um, in addition, I'd like to thank the Missou Missoula Community Access Theater for video recording this conference, which will be available through a link on the AHEC website. And lastly, but most importantly, I'd like to thank Dr. Jennifer Schneider uh, for traveling all the way from Arizona to be our keynote speaker and for also playing a role in our breakout sessions, community conversation. Um, we're asking her to do a lot uh, in her time here, and we greatly appreciate her expertise in this area. Um, going back to what started the idea of pain as inevitable, suffering as, as optional, an ethical approach to pain, it started for me um, when I saw this slide uh, from the CDC. Um, this was a year or two ago. Um, it, made, it made me think, from 1999 to 2013, the amount of prescription painkillers prescribed and sold in the U.S. nearly quadrupled. Yet there has been no overall change in the amount of pain that Americans report. And it started my thinking, you know, we started out on a brave initiative in the late 90s of bringing pain out of the shadows, bringing it into the forelight, and let's start discussing how we manage pain and taking care of patients with pain. The initial response was an opiate response. Um, and the, the idea was, and it should be that, okay, if we put more opiates in the market, we should be able to cure some of the pain. However, the data doesn't seem to be supporting that, at least as far as the report of pain. Not saying that opiates aren't a tool that can help, but as a panacea and as a, a broad spectrum, one way whitewashing, one way of trying to do this, it doesn't seem to be the correct way. So the idea of the conference was we need to focus away from an opiate-centric, single modality um, and pain-centered focus and focus more on suffering, improving quality of life, multimodal approach, to improving pain, patients' pain and suffering. And thus, the idea of pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. 
we've been paying a little bit too much attention maybe to the pain and maybe we should be addressing the entire suffering and the inv individual as a whole and get them functioning better. So that's what started this part. The next part is gonna be a broad initiative um, that's gonna be somewhat of an experiment. I'm not sure how it's gonna work out. Um, we have two breakout sessions um, today and tomorrow. What we wanna do is take a look at ethically, take a look at the state of where we're at right now with managing pain and look at it under the four pillars of ethics and see if we can find out and identify what are the significant issues we're having right now and the tomorrow find solutions for them in our breakout sessions after we've gone through this conference. So for example, um, and this is where I learned how to find everything I need to know about ethics right here. Um, believe it or not, this was a good resource. It worked well for me. Um, it's about at my level of reading, so it worked well. Um, beneficence. Um, this is the first pillar of medical ethics. And it states, all healthcare providers must strive to improve their patient's health to do the most good for the patient in every situation. But what is good for one patient may not be good for another. So each situation should be considered individually. And other values that might conflict with beneficence may need to be considered. So in the breakout sessions later today, each, each, each individual medical discipline will break out into their uh, individual discipline and look at what they may be challenged with or facing with in their discipline in regard to beneficence in helping patients. For example, on this one, I can think of several things on the physician side uh, of, you know, such thing, all health providers must strive to improve the patient's health. And I think, is it ethical for areas in our state that providers decide not to treat with opiates, not to treat with pain, and they just totally say, blank, I'm not managing that. Is it fine for whole towns to shut down? and not manage pain. Is that ethical? Um, next would be non-malfeasance. First, do no harm as a bedrock of medical ethics. In every situation, healthcare providers should avoid causing harm to their patients in society. Be aware of the doctrine of double, double effect, where a treatment indeed intended for good unintentionally causes harm. This doctrine helps make difficult decisions about whether actions with double effects can be undertaken. And, we need to ask the question, at least from a physician's side or um, my side, you know, how do we feel about not everyone using prescription drug registry and making sure that, you know, medications are being prescribed appropriately, being used appropriately? How do we feel about, um, you know, certain pharmacists not participating with that? Is that ethical? So those kind of challenges are what we're looking for in this afternoon session. Autonomy, people have the right to control what happens to their bodies. This principle simply means that an informed, competent adult can refuse or accept uh, treatment, drugs, and surgeries according to their wishes. People have the right to control what happens to their bodies because they are free and rational. And these decisions must be respected by everyone, even if those decisions aren't in the best interest of the patient. And I have talked with several patients and I've heard from them that they feel sometimes coerced into having things done to them. Um, they need to do this um, for them to get this. And do we think that is an ethical thing? Um, and lastly is justice. Um, the fourth principle demands you should try to be as fair as possible when offering treatments to patients and allocating scarce medical resources. You should be able to justify your actions in every situation. And from a physician standpoint, you know, is it ethical that certain insurance carriers will cover, I'm thinking in Medicare, they can only get 10 PT treatments per year. Um, I might be wrong on those numbers, whereas other insurance carriers might be able to get more. Should we be working on some type of effort to get those changed? Um, I do know that there is a lot of interest in what we may be able to come up with at this conference. Um, I did have a chance to talk with the Montana Board of Medical uh, Examiners. They're very interested. They're looking at guidance on re in regard to pain management in our state. So what we can come up together with as a consensus group would be Excellent. I know the Montana Medical Association is very interested in what we might be able to accomplish with this, um, as well as I'm sure the Montana uh, Board of Pharmacy and several other organizations throughout the state would be interested in what each one of you bring to the table. Each one of you have a distinct and unique view of pain management here in the state, and you bring a distinct and unique uh, piece to the puzzle. And if we can get all those puzzles together, I am hopeful we can come up with a great consensus for the plan for the state. Um, I'll explain, hopefully this doesn't lose everyone on what we're trying to do with the experiment this afternoon. I'll go through it again this afternoon when we do our breakout sessions. But um, 
that's it for my introduction. And before we get started, I, um, uh, Dean Reed Humphrey uh, will come up and speak uh, shortly, and uh, followed by Scott Wittenberg. So <sighs> thank you, and welcome once again. Thanks, Mark. I, I think Scott thought that he was going to be able to introduce me a bit. This <laughs> has worked out really well, actually, for me. Oh. Oh. Except for the part where you couldn't hear me. Yeah, yeah actually. Uh, I just, I'll be very brief because I know you want to get to the, to the program of the day. And uh, uh, so, so I'm Dean Reed Humphrey in the uh, uh, College of Health Professions and Biomedical Sciences at the University. Uh, and I, I just wanted to say welcome uh, to the conference. Uh, it's an exciting program, I, and I would have, I, I'd like to acknowledge everyone that, uh, that Mark already acknowledged. So trust me when I say I appreciate that Mark has already acknowledged everyone, so thank you. When you see someone with that name badge just on the council, uh, give them a special thanks. Uh, you know, the college grew uh, over the last uh, 30 years from a school of pharmacy to a, a college that uh, includes, of course, uh, pharmacy practice and uh, 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 physical therapy, public health, social work, uh, and, the, uh, 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 and then the biomedical sciences, which is the, the research arm of the college. Uh, and the, uh, uh, I think it's, when I became dean a couple of years ago, it's really apparent to me that, that uh, while uh, we were doing a great job, I think, of producing clinicians and, uh, uh, and planning for the, uh, sort of the next generation of healthcare professionals, that, uh, that, uh, that we needed to be stronger in our, in our, in our uh, allegiance to the mission of the university, which is serving the citizens of Montana. Uh, and there's probably no uh, more significant area where we can be of, uh, of, of practical uh, assistance, in the, but in the area of, of, the, of health professions, biomedical sciences. So the, the college has evolved. You know, we, we brought on the family medical residency program uh, more, uh, just a little over three years ago, we graduate the first class of residents this July. More than half, or about half, have already committed it to uh, positions in Montana in primary care. Uh, and uh, the, uh, with the addition of AHEC a number of years ago, we were able to begin to really, uh, I think, reach out and, uh, and do f uh, uh, a far better job of, of uh, bringing kids into the health professions, into the biomedical sciences, whether it was, whether it's for uh, clinical practice, uh, to progress on to post baccalaureate programs or medical school, uh, and uh, in the mo in, in most recently, uh, we picked up the uh, uh, the placement of the Whammy students uh, in the, in the Whammy program, uh, and finally the provision of uh, of, uh, of CEU to uh, to physicians and other clinicians in the community. So the university, I think, is is in, in the colleges, is moving uh, deliberately and intentionally to be a stronger collaborator in healthcare and. Uh, the most recent initiative, and I would encourage you uh, when you have an opportunity to, to explore the University of Montana Health and Medicine, which is an initiative that we, uh, that we, uh, we began this year, which is really to, to knit the programs, the academic uh, enterprise in health uh, across the campus. Uh, uh, but likewise, uh, and the other important element of that is to, uh, besides creating a portal where kids can, and, and parents and counselors can, can learn about health careers in Montana and how they can pursue that, uh, the other really important arm uh, and intent of UM Health and Medicine uh, is to make certain that the community and the people in the region and clinicians uh, such as yourselves don't view the university and, and the college as sort of this academic island that, that creates clinicians. Rather, as, as we move uh, more steadfastly towards a, a, an era where it's a value-based uh, intervention, where the, the patient is in the center, where interprofessional collaborative practice becomes so important. Uh, and uh, the university has a, has a significant stake in working with you to make certain that we're meeting the needs of the community and the citizens of Montana. So uh, I want to, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank uh, all of you, because I know in this audience there are, there are many of you uh, from different disciplines who act as preceptors, as, as clinical instructors, mm -hmm mentors for our students uh, uh, before they enter programs and when they're in post-bac programs as well. So thank you uh, for, uh, for stepping up and, and helping prepare that next generation of, of, uh, of interprofessionally developed clinicians. Uh, 
And uh, so I, I would encourage you to have a look at UMHM and uh, feel free to contact me directly uh, if you have ideas about how we can better collaborate, how the university can be stronger partners. I grew up in, uh, in uh, back in the East Coast where, uh, where the, uh, uh, the health, where the university was uh, central to uh, the provision and the education and, 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 uh, and research in healthcare. And, uh, and I want the same for Montana. Uh, it would be a, uh, it's kind of shame on us if we don't make that happen. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, I was told to be brief, so I'm uh, always asked to be brief, and I'm always happy to comply with that. So, but I would, uh, I would like to uh, transition and let uh, Scott Wittenberg have, uh, uh, have a few words as well as Vice President for Research and Creative Scholarship. So thank you very much for coming. I hope you have a great couple of days. Thanks, Mark Mantel and, and, and the uh, organizing committee as well. Thanks very much. Uh, actually, so uh, I guess you were brief and I have a few words, so I guess that's even less. Uh, I'm usually invited to do these kinds of things when the president is out of town, which is of course true again, so that's why I'm here to welcome you to the University of Montana. I wanted to follow up on Reed's comment about growth, growth within his college, and talk a little bit about research, because sometimes that's not a story we tell enough about at the University of Montana. This year we'll do about $80 million worth of uh, funded research at the university, and that's a 40% growth in the amount of research we've done over the last uh, two years. A big portion of that, about 15 million of that, is from NIH funded research. And uh, that means we'll do probably more funded NIH uh, research than any other institution in the state. So there's these perceptions about, you know, the University of Montana versus other institutions. And I just want to sort of clarify that, that we are a powerhouse of a research institution, and a lot of that is in the health uh, professions area. Uh, and now I'm, I really am going to be brief because I'm supposed to be inflicting pain on a golf course right now, so I am headed out of here. And I have no idea who I'm supposed to introduce next. <laughs> so I, I think it's time for us to delve in if everyone's ready to uh, roll up their sleeves and get ready for this morning. Um, I have the distinct pleasure and honor um, and um, to introduce Jennifer Schneider, uh, MD, PhD. Um, and before I introduce her, I need to slip my glasses down so I can see. Um, Dr. Schneider is a nationally recognized expert in the management of chronic pain. Um, she is certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, and is a diplomat of the American Academy of Pain Management. Dr. Schneider is a fellow of the American College of Physicians um, and is the author of numerous papers in professional journal journals in the addiction and pain management fields, as well as the book Living with Chronic Opiate Pain, uh, second edition, 2009. For many years, she practiced internal medicine, addiction medicine, and pain management and has had extensive expertise in educating healthcare providers internationally on the medication management of chronic pain. She also teaches a remedial course on appropriate prescriber uh, on controlled substances to physicians and other prescribers who are mandated to take such a course by their medical licensing boards and to others who take the course proactively. Before medical school, Dr. Schneider earned her PhD from the University of Michigan in molecular genetics. Um, more information about Dr. Schneider can be found on her website. I don't know of many doctors who have a website, but if you have a website, you must be pretty important. Um, um, and uh, more importantly, um, I have had the distinct honor to, uh, and pleasure to talk with Dr. Schneider on uh, several occasions prior to this conference. And um, what I have found with her is a kindred spirit who feels very passionate and similar to myself. And I'm sure you'll find that her feelings and her um, management style is very kindred to all of you as well. So if I can introduce uh, Dr. Jennifer Schneider and apologize about my phone, that will go away. <laughs> Okay, so um, for the past four years, I've been involved uh, in Tucson 
in uh, a program called the Echo Pain Conference. Some of you may have heard that um, because there's several versions of it. Um, so we meet weekly, a team of us, um, experts in various parts, aspects of pain management, and we're connected by um, teleconference to multiple pain clinics, uh, multiple primary care clinics all over the US. And um, what they do is each week, which we have a two hour session, where we hear three cases of complicated, complex, chronic pain, we give them feedback and suggestions. And in addition, we have a 30 minute didactic session. We take turns speaking on this or that. And um, what I have found is that most of the patients who are presented in the, uh, by these uh, clinics that are having problems with them have, it turns out that the big problem with them is behavioral health issues rather than actual medication management or diagnosis or things like that. And so it's really uh, changed my thinking about the treatment of chronic pain. When I think of the way I managed it when I was in, in practicing patients, which I haven't done for a few years, is I was focused on the medications and on um, exercise and physical therapy and stuff like that. But the missing piece really was the behavioral health. And so uh, now I've learned a great deal about that. And, and uh, as it turns out, last month, one of the physicians in, on my team, oh, and let me say the team consists of an interventionalist, myself with the addiction and medications, also a pharmacy professor, um, someone who's an expert on, on alternative complementary medicine. Uh, and we have a physical therapist coming in uh, every once in a while. Um, so uh, last month, the guy who runs the whole thing, his name is Dr. Bennett Davis, uh, was giving, it happened to be that his, his talk was called What is Pain? And by the way, we have heard each other giving essentially the same talk multiple times over the past four years. But as I listened to him this time, I said, oh my gosh, that's my talk. So at the end, I asked him if I could borrow his slides. Said he said, sure. So I'm speaking for the first time. Usually I speak for my own slides, which I've talked from a thousand times and I don't have to even think about it, but this is a new slide set for me. And um, so I want to credit Dr. Davis who allowed me to use the slide set and we're going to go through it. And I have 30 minutes. Uh, I know we started like 15 minutes late, so. Okay, so the traditional perspective on chronic, uh, on what is pain comes from Rene Descartes like many, many, many years ago. 17th century, and it's the traditional view that you have the pain generator, which in this case is a fire. It could, for us, it would be like we always say a burning stove. You touch it, and now you've got signals that are going up from the original site of the pain, which in this case was the foot, going right up to the brain. That's the traditional view about pain. But as it turns out, there are, we now know that there are three types of pain, right? There's the nociceptive pain, which we're going to be talking about in a minute. There's a the neuropathic pain, and then there's something else. And the something else is a variant of neuropathic pain for which we don't have good terminology at this point. And the, um, the International Association on Pain calls it pain without tissue damage, usually for psychological reasons. And we call it nervous system dysregulation. So this is their definition, the ISP definition of pain from four years ago. So many people report pain in the absence of tissue damage or any likely pathophysiologic cause. And usually this happens for psychological reasons. And there's usually no way to distinguish their experience from that due to tissue damage. If they regard their experience as pain and if they report it in the same way as pain caused by tissue damage, it should be accepted as pain. This definition avoids tying pain to the stimulus. A lot of people think you have to have a pain generator in order for pain to be, quote, legitimate. And what this is, definition from the IASP says, that's not the case. So activity induced in the nociceptor, the nociceptor is the part of the peripheral nerve that, um, that uh, senses mechanical signals such as pressure, stretching, vibration or heat, and then transmits it to the central nervous system. And this is what the ISP says is not pain. All right, this is just the, um, 
mechanism that leads to pain, which is a psychological state. It's the way the, the brain responds. And that's true even if there is, though usually there is a physical cause, but there doesn't have to be a physical cause. So talking about nociceptive pain, all right, nociceptive pain starts with a signal, heat, stretching, vibration, and so forth. And it is changed in the, thank you. It's changed, I'm gonna see how long I can stand. <laughs> Um, it, it is changed into an electrical signal that uh, is sent through the peripheral nerve, transmitted to the central nervous system, where it can be modulated, it can be increased or decreased depending on various things, and then it goes up to the somatosensory cortex in the brain where it is perceived. And interestingly, the perception often is later than the actual action by the brain. And the classic example of that is, if you touch a hot stove, what's gonna happen? You're gonna be pulling your hand away even before you realize that you have pain. I mean, by the time you realize that you just touched a hot surface, your hand will not be on it anymore. So that's the interesting thing about the way the brain deals with pain. Now, then we have no susceptible, then we've got, excuse me, neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is missing the nociceptor, the nociceptor part in the peripheral nervous system. And what, the thing about neuropathic pain is um, this is pain that is caused by either by abnormal nerve function or by actual damage to the nerves. And so you don't have the initial part that you, you've got in the, in the um, nociceptive pain. So what happens is now there's damage to the nervous system and Therefore, you're already starting with some problem in the nervous system. It is then transmitted to the spinal cord and thalamus. It's modulated, goes into the central nervous system where you perceive it. So it's missing the first step. You don't have that actual nociceptor, the pain generator that you can see. So some examples, both of these, nociceptive and neuropathic, are examples of what's called somatosensory pain. So the the somatic and visceral pain would include arthritis, back pain, burns, fractures, secondary headaches such as caused by trauma or infection, chronic pelvic pain, interstitial cystitis, and endometriosis. So those are some examples of nociceptive pain. This is the kind that's shown in that diagram by Descartes. It's where you, you can see the pain going up. Uh, neuropathic pain examples that we've all seen in our practice would be RSD, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is also called CRPS, post-herpetic neuralgia, or shingles, peripheral diabetic neuropathy, phantom limb pain, post-stroke, primary headache, which would include migraine, trigeminal neuralgia, and, and fibromyalgia. Those are all examples of neuropathic pain. So here's what happens with, with pain processing in the, in the brain. The example that's shown here in the, in the picture of the, the Descartes model is you've got the stimulus, which would be the burn in the left foot. You've got the sensory processing, goes up to the brain, and the result is you feel pain. Right? It's, it's a very simple thing, and you say, ow, my foot's on fire. Right? Now, more complicated is the fact that we also have emotional processing of pain stimulus, causing emotional distress and unpleasantness, and that's the part where you've got this emotional reaction and more disability. I mean, the disability has an emotional component. Well, this is just a picture of the brain, and I, you know, it's complicated. I'm not gonna say a lot about it, other than the fact that, there's two, that pain is processed in two ways in the brain. All right, you've got the sensory pain pathway, which is in, more in the rear of the brain, and then more in the front, you've got the affective or emotional processing, all right? And then they both come together. They both provide input into the, the way the brain perceives the pain and then sends it back, and then it sends it to what you are perceiving, all right? So this is a very interesting study by Ethan Cross et al., 2011, where they wanted to see how the brain responds to emotional pain versus how the, pain, how the brain responds to physical pain. 
all right? So they did this study where they took 40 people and did a functional MRI on them in two situations. One, when they are lying there in the machine, in the MRI machine, and these are people, all of whom have recently had their primary relationship break up. And it was early on after it broke up and they were grieving the loss of the other person. So they are shown the picture of the other person and asked, how do you feel when you see this picture? And then they do the functional MRI. That's the one situation. Then separately, they are subjected to a heat stimulus in the arm, which hurts. That's, you know, physical, the standard old-fashioned pain. And they see where you have, which parts of the brain light up. And what they, found, they find out here is that in both of these situations, one of which they call social rejection and the other they call physical pain, in both of these, you have the same, both regions in the brain lighting up. The, the part in the back that responds to the sensory, the, the sensory response, in other words, to the physical pain, and the part in the front of the brain that responds to the emotional. The brain activity is the same whether the pain was caused by a burn or a very hot area or by social rejection, by the pain of, end, of the relationship ending. I mean, that is really mind-boggling when you think about it because it's, it's sort of counteracts the way that traditionally we've thought about pain, which is that pain has got to have, you know, a pain generator, a physical source, something that we can identify. So it's, you know, that, that's, that, that to me really was a very, very interesting phenomenon, and this is evidence that it's true. So putting together the lessons of, of the preceding, excuse me, I'm going to try to put this on. Okay, putting together the lessons of these two um, slides, when you think about it, mental health issues can produce the same affective pain as nociceptive input from joints and nerves, and approximately half of our pain patients are suffering mostly due to psychological issues rather than the tissue pathology. I mean, that, that's really mind-blowing, right? And what we need to understand, and what most people, I think, find it hard to accept, is that the pain and su the suffering, the suffering, basically, of these people is just as real as that of, like, rheumatoid arthritis. That's what the functional MRI says. So the change in thinking embodied by this new definition of the IASP has led us to formulate a new approach. So, we ha so you can have a pathoanatomic lesion, all right? That would be the sensory signal, which leads to mechanical stimulus and pain stimulus. And that results in, obviously, people experiencing pain. Uh, that's the old way, right? But the newer way is, let me see, okay. The, the new way is that we also have all these emotional response, and that is contributed to by the way you think about it, which is why cognitive behavioral therapy can be so helpful, changing the things you say to yourself about it, by social factors, what's expected of you, uh, by your culture, your society, uh, and, and psychological factors. And all that contributes to what is perceived as pain. That's the suffering part of it. Now, so in a patient with psychological factors, it really changes everything because you have a big component to, uh, that adds, in addition to the sensory processing, you've got the emotional processing, and which results in emotional distress. And so what you perceive is both pain and, and disability and the, all these emotional things and the suffering. There are things that make it more likely that you are going to have all this emotional pain con connected with your sensory pain. And they include things like depression, and we all know that depression contributes, exacerbates pain. Uh, traumatic experience, which could be war, abuse, disasters, etc. All of that can make the disability, the emotional part of it, greater, as that's why the disability is in bigger letters in this slide, all right? So, 
I was just going to briefly show you a picture of, uh, about a patient who was caught up in a hostage situation three years ago. So she was physically unharmed, but this became a very obviously traumatic experience to her. So she presented to the Integrative Pain Center of Arizona, which is the, this clinic that sponsors the, the, the weekly teleconference. And so she was a patient there and had been referred from her primary care doc with complaints of three years of diffuse pain that was not responding to opioids at high doses. So the referring diagnosis was fibromyalgia, right? And you probably do the same thing they do at uh, our clinic, which is you ask them to fill out a diagram of how they perceive their pain. And uh, so they were asked to put an X on um, this pain diagram about where, where they're having the pain and where it hurts the worst. And, uh, and then she, in addition to doing that, she also had written some things, right? Um, uh, my legs hurt so bad it scares me. Statements like that are really a giveaway that there's a big emotional component to the pain. And this is the way this woman prescribed her pain. So just from this picture, you, as well as her history of obviously a very traumatic event, and, and remember, she's had the pain for as long as she, since three years ago, which was when she had this, uh, she was held hostage in fear of her life. So you know that this is a kind of patient that throwing opioids at them is not going to solve the problem. And these are the kind of patients who may need it to take more and more. And it isn't really going to help them. So the, the way to look at this is that the psychological components result in nervous system dysregulation. And this, as we said before, can result from developmental trauma, from adult trauma. And the way the patient uh, presents Lots of opioids, but not working. Multiple somatic complaints that are difficult to explain. Uh, insomnia, fatigue, anxiety and depression, substance abuse, impulsive high-risk behaviors. Um, these patients often have diffuse pain out of proportion to the objective evidence of tissue pathology. They are um, more likely to be obese or have other eating disorders, and they are at increased risk of diabetes, COPD, and autoimmune disorders. And um, when you do an ACE score, everybody here familiar with the ACE questionnaire, and that's adverse childhood events, it's really a very good idea to, when you're treating someone with chronic pain, um, and it's not an absolutely straightforward situation, it's very helpful to do a, a, to have them fill out this questionnaire, the adverse childhood events or something similar, and you can find this online, where they ask you questions about were you abused as a child and things like that. Were you afraid of what, of what was happening? Because the higher the, the, the score that they had in, in their childhood on this questionnaire, the more likely they, ha they are to have all these issues as adults and to respond in this way to, uh, to some pain situation. And there are, there are studies that show that when the, um, the ACE score is worse than five out of 10, there are 10 questions, um, you have a significantly shorter likelihood of living, so of lifespan, because you're going to have all these medical issues. Um, interesting. So some of the signs of ramped up emotional pain processing, which is what we're talking about, are things like um, depression, high score on the Beck depression uh, scale, anxiety, diffuse pain without a clear explanation, um, patients reported disability seems out of proportion to their physical pathology, they are, um, uh, their pain behaviors, the way they describe their pain, if they do something like the McGill pain questionnaire, there's a bunch of words on there, they check off the way to describe their pain, and if they use words like, um, it's exhausting, sickening, fearful, terrifying, punishing, cruel, or they say, I'm crying in pain, that language is very suggestive of the fact that they've got emotional, uh, emotional pain that is affecting the entire picture and that they really need more than just medications. So when you talk to them, you have to frame the discussion in terms of the nervous system. So the body is sensing what's going on, and that would be nociceptive pain. And the way nociceptive pain is um, treated would be 
opioids, anti-inflammatories, steroids, exercise and diet, um, interventional procedures, and surgery. And the team that you need to treat someone who's got like strictly, thank you, five minutes, uh, strictly nociceptive pain would be a physical therapy, an orthopedic surgeon, neurosurgeons, rheumatologists, pain specialists, and the, piece, and the primary care doc needs to implement and coordinate the treatment algorithms. All right, so next, if you've got nervous system type pain, in other words, classical neuropathic pain or pain without tissue pathology, you, for, for a neuropathic pain, um, there, we have other medications that are effective, um, like gabapentin and pregabalin, in addition to opioids, that also acupuncture, nerve blocks, and, and so forth, neurostimulation, so that would be like um, um, a spinal cord stimulator or a TENS unit, co and cognitive behavioral therapy, and you've got to get the relevant team involved. Um, and you have to understand that these are people who've got uh, either signs of either neuropath, classic neuropathic pain or else the ramped up emotional processing of pain. And finally, we talk about the mind. We explain to the patients the mind is how you perceive the pain. And again, you can use opioids, antidepressants, anxiolytics, but here we add psychodynamic therapy as well as cognitive behavioral therapy. And so the psychiatrist and the therapist and the neuropsychologist um, need to be involved in that, and the PCP has to understand that they've got to adapt the treatment. In other words, you absolutely have got to get involved in, in that treatment, in understanding that a lot of this pain, which is due to, to ramped up emotional, has to be uh, dealt with directly. Now, this is my favorite slide on this, because, uh, and this is not based on data, this is, the, this is our opinion on the different kinds of patients that we see. So first we've got the, in green, we've got the patients who have classical nociceptive or neuropathic pain from tissue injury, and those people um, often will do fairly well on um, a relatively low dose of opioids, but notice that some of them will need over 100, over 200, so that there are patients that absolutely benefit in terms of their function, that improve, and that should be able to be treated with these higher doses, and it, to me it's very upsetting that several states now have maximum morphine equivalents per day that go between 80 and 120, and you can see as it shows here the green line that there are patients that really would do well on, um, on high doses, and they should be able to get them. But look at these other three, three graphs. You've got the substance abuse population, they want more and more and more. You've got the diversion population, they obviously want more and more and more. Um, and you've got the people with pain uh, for psychological reasons without the tissue pathology population. They fall into that too. So what we need to do when we have patients, especially those who seem to require high doses, is to differentiate between among these four populations and not to rule out treating patients with high doses if they fall into the first class, but also to consider that, to rule out, to do the due diligence to rule out these other populations, the substance abuse and, and the diversion, and then also to really keep in mind that we may be talking about pain for psychological reasons. So what we wanna do is eliminate the nociceptive input if it's relevant to do so. So we're talking about surgery, for example, you want to um, uh, deal with the CNS sensory processing. So you want to treat specific neuropathic pain syndromes. You want to address the anxiety and trauma and depression, uh, the attitudes and beliefs that are, uh, are affecting the way they process the pain. And you want to intervene early to prevent chronicity. What we find is that undertreated acute pain is a major contributor to chronic pain, that if you treat the pain early, you can prevent it. There are studies now, for example, that show that babies who are um, subjected to painful procedures without anesthesia, because they can't really tell us they're hurting, they are more likely as they get older to end up with chronic pain from any, from any other source. In other words, you sensitize their nervous system to where they're gonna have more pain for whatever. 
and lifestyle change is super important. They have to do their part to participate in the team. You can't just be prescribing medications for them if they're not willing to go to PT, to do the exercises, to deal with behavioral health issues. So, last slide. What we need to deal with when we're talking about patients with chronic pain is that you've got to have an integrative, interdisciplinary, patient-centered approach that includes the interventional specialists, the medical specialists, and the behavioral specialists. Thank you. Oh, do I stay up here for questions? I'm going to have this hold till this afternoon when you can talk to get there sometime. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, no questions because we were started late. <laughs> uh, what we're going to do is we do have the. Um, oh, Linda, just say, <laughs> for just a second. Let me Ooh, get you. No <laughs> Thank you. What we're going to do is hold questions. So, any questions from this session, if you can hold to this afternoon, we have the um, pleasure of having Jennifer speak toward the end of the day. Um, that will help us get back on time and get us right to where we need to go next. So please hold the questions for this afternoon. We'll have a lot of time for Jennifer uh, to answer those this, this afternoon. So um, I appreciate your patience and uh, with that. Good morning. My name is Linda Torma. I'm a clinical nurse specialist. I am a former faculty member with uh, Montana State University College of Nursing, recently retired, and I've had the, the opportunity to work with this wonderful planning group on pain and planning this particular conference. But my interest in pain goes beyond my, my tenure with the College of Nursing. I was very instrumental in working to bring the American Pain Society's initiative to make pain a fifth vital sign to Missoula back in 1995. And I'd be happy to talk with anybody who's concerned about that particular initiative. I hear it over and over again that that's really what created this problem. And I just want to clarify that what, as a nurse, we were excited because it gave us a metric to begin to talk about how do we evaluate the effectiveness of any treatment uh, <clears throat> for pain. And um, so Mark's slide at the beginning where we looked and saw how the opioids really haven't been effective. Part of that is because we started asking about pain and measuring it and seeing the scope of the problem. So the real issue is not making pain a fifth vital sign. It's trying to take a, a simple solution to a very complex chronic problem. And we're now at the point where we can start talking about some different ways to approach that. And I'm very excited <clears throat> to be part of that. The person that I'm introducing is Lind Dr. Lindsay Lancaster. She is from Portland. She is a colleague of mine. We met in the doctoral program. We both had the opportunity to work with Dr. Kim Jones, who is a fibromyalgia researcher at the Oregon Health Sciences University. <coughs> um, and she was one of the first researchers to actually introduce the idea of exercise for people with fibromyalgia. Lindsay is a um, wonderful colleague. We were both in the doctoral program together throughout the the majority of Dr. Lancaster's career, she has had the honor of maintaining a clinical practice serving individuals with complex chronic pain disorders and a program of research investigating best practice for chronic pain management. Dr. Lancaster is currently a co-investigator on one of the National Institutes of Health, NIH first pragmatic clinical trials, an innovative method of investigation that embeds clinical research into the complex healthcare system. This interdisciplinary research pulls together health system leaders, primary care providers, nurses, behavioral specialists, physical therapists, and pharmacists to actualize the individual and system level practices and processes necessary to achieve optimal pain management for patients with complex chronic pain conditions. Dr. Lancaster is going to be speaking about the nursing role in pain management, and I'm very excited to introduce her to you. Good morning. Uh, first off, I just want to thank the planning committee for inviting me. It's just an honor to be here and an, an honor to engage in the work that you guys are doing. I'm uh, so impressed. Let's see, organize myself here. All right. So 
as I think about the work that I do as a nurse caring for uh, uh, individuals with persistent pain, I, and I think about the, the guiding principles and actions that, that drive my work and also drive the work that I do with um, nurses moving into this field. I'll, I'll talk more about the program that I'm working in and the, the, um, the, the approach we take with working with patients. And we're really fortunate um, as nurses and as all practitioners working with individuals with persistent pain to really be guided by the National Pain Strategy. Uh, I'll speak a little bit more about the National Pain Strategy, but it really came out of the, um, the, the, the problem that Mark and Linda both spoke to in um, uh, attempting to treat a very complex, um, involved problem, that of persistent pain with a relatively uh, simple, simple solution, um, really focusing on medications and procedures. So the National Pain Strategy um, was developed by the NIH Pain Consortium. It's an interagency group that um, looked at what is the best evidence for managing persistent pain, um, the whole biopsychosocial approach of that, and, um, and, and what are the guiding principles of that. Um, so I've decided to organize kind of my thoughts about what guides my principles and actions as a nurse according to what the National Pain Strategy is recommending and also speak to that um, in the program that I currently work in. I worked in many different uh, pain programs uh, throughout my tenure um, in, in managing chronic pain and the current program that I work in now and um, and that I'll be speaking to a lot today I think is the, the model that most uh, most involves these national pain strategy recommendations. So it's, it's really what I think about driving my practice and, and hopefully the, the nurses that I work with and um, hopefully uh, some tidbits for, for everybody here as well. So the national pain strategy really um, states that um, instead of a, um, uh, an approach that really relies on uh, medications and procedures and speaks to a lot of what Dr. Schneider was talking about in that no susceptive model of pain, but really looking at how do we manage um, uh, individuals with persistent pain, how do we manage the whole, um, the whole dynamic of what's going on in their situation. The National Pain Strategy recommends that any program is patient-centered. That means that it addresses the nuances, um, the unique aspects of every single individual situation, that we can't simply take this um, this uh, basic model with three components and apply it to every individual with persistent pain. They're all unique. They, they bring different um, uh, attributes, different experiences, as, as Dr. Schneider spoke about. And so how can we really um, tailor that to meet their unique me needs? It also um, encourages us to use an integrative approach. And um, what that means is that we're, uh, we're blending treatments together. We're not simply saying, okay, we're gonna treat the nociceptive component, we're gonna, or we're just gonna treat the psychological component, or we're only gonna treat the, the social component. We're bringing those together in an integrative manner that, that treats the whole picture of the, the patient, their situation, and, and their life that they're, they're working to lead. Um, it really focuses on a biopsychosocial model. I'll be talking a lot about that today. Um, but really to say that we can't just treat the bio component. We can't just treat the psych component. We can't just treat the, the social component. We need to bring all of those components together to make sure we have a very holistic plan for, for the, the individuals we're working with. Um, it also um, really speaks to the importance of making this full spectrum of treatment options accessible to every individual who, who lives with persistent pain. Um, and as I think about that, how do we make that accessible to all patients? And I think about if we are using strategies that, um, that don't rely on costly procedures or don't rely on uh, individual medication coverage, if we're relying on principles that we can uh, help the patient learn to embed in their, whole, in their daily lives, that's, a, that's accessible to all. So I, um, the National Pain Strategy is really working to shift this paradigm of, of, of managing persistent pain. Um, I feel the, this, this guiding principle is really exciting to me, particularly as a nurse and particularly as someone who is working with other nurses to, to, uh, uh, who have the honor of working with this population. Um, it's really shifting that focus to um, make this an integrative, um, very holistic approach. 
as I mentioned, I um, have, the, have had the incredible fortune over the years to work in various different pain programs operating on various different models. And um, the, the current program that I work is uh, actually uh, one of NIH's uh, first pragmatic trials. And so a, pragma a pragmatic trial is where um, research is being done in a different way. NIH really did, uh, you know, recognize that the research being done in the ivory tower in the medical schools, um, is, as probably you guys all know, the statistic takes 17 years to actually get that down into the um, into the the daily work with the patient. So the NIH said, well, let's be doing this in a different way. Let's take the best practice approaches, but then embed it in the mud and the muck of the healthcare system because that's where things usually break down. So why don't we just start there? Um, so I've just been incredibly fortunate to work with this program. Um, we truly did take, we uh, looked at all the literature on um, what are the best principles for, for managing uh, persistent pain and, and, and bringing that to the healthcare system. Um, we, um, the individuals that we work with in this program, which is um, um, uh, rolled out in um, several different clinics within Kaiser Permanente. We're in the Northwest, we're in Georgia and in Hawaii, so really this wide systematic approach. Um, the population of patients we're working with are, are patients who are working to manage complex uh, persistent pain. So um, multiple pain diagnoses, very, uh, so often a uh, psychological overlay, not because that's where the pain started necessarily, but because we know if someone's living with pain 24 hours a day, 365 years, there's going to be a, a psychosocial component to that as well. Many of the patients we're working with have had previous failures. Um, uh, not typically by their own doing, but a failure of the medical system to really help them get them where they need to be. Um, and so our team, um, myself, um, all the nurses who work in this program, really believe that it's our moral obligation to, to help these patients. So oftentimes the, the, the care that we've given over the past years, and I can, I can speak to that as well, thinking about the care I gave uh, 15 years ago, um, has often perpetuated the, the situation where they're in now. So it really is our ethical obligation obligation. The program works to integrate um, cognitive uh, strategies, behavioral skills, and of course address the physiological component as well. Uh, we use a coaching model, uh, so coaching via group coaching, individual coaching, face-to-face -face coaching, telephone coaching, online coaching, uh, to really be standing there with the patient uh, as they move forward. Um, and uh, this program is embedded in primary care. Uh, we firmly believe that um, the best place to manage persistent pain is in the primary care environment. Um, um, uh, tertiary care pain centers are highly effective um, for a brief period of time, but where the patient is going to be living their life and being managed is in, within the primary care environment. Um, so this is very much a um, cognitive behavioral model. Uh, I was uh, just last month at the American Pain Society, and um, the president there said, gosh, if we had a pill that was effective in the majority of cases, and if we had a pill that had zero side effects, if we had a pill that was accessible to everybody, we would all be using it. We would be making a lot of money on that pill. Well, we actually do have that pill, and it's cognitive behavioral therapy. So um, really a, a focus um, on looking at um, uh, strategies of this. We are a multidisciplinary team, and I'll talk more about that. Um, the... Um, uh, the, the lead of this team is, is truly the nurse and the behavioral specialist. So everything that I'm going to be talking about today is what I do as a nurse and what I train the nurses in this program to do as nurses. Um, these are not advanced practice nurses. These are, are RNs, uh, baccalaureate prepared, um, even uh, from pra practical programs. So these are approaches that um, truly come from a nursing fundamental um, uh, um, approach. So as I think about that, I think about um, the nursing scope of practice, of course, and I think about um, where the focus, um, where health systems have often placed the focus of nursing. And I feel like the, the focus of nursing has often been towards the biological aspect of the person. So how do we work with those physical modalities? How do we um, address that physiological component of a condition? And um, 
uh, I believe firmly that our role as nurses is, is so much more vast. Uh, I also teach in a school of nursing, and the nurses that I train are um, every bit as ready to deliver um, cognitive approaches, behavioral approaches, and truly address that biopsychosocial uh, continuum of the patient. Um, so we in the program work very hard to uh, have our nurses work at the top of their scope of practice and truly address the, the holistic uh, manner of, of the patient. If we, if we as nurses are focusing only on the biological component, then we're really missing, we're, we're creating a huge gap in the care of the patient. So much of what I'll be talking about today really fits in that biopsychosocial component and um, is truly bringing uh, uh, allowing the nurse to operate at their full capacity. Um, so uh, the, the, national pain, uh, the national pain strategy encourage us, encourages us obviously to use evidence-based pain care within an interdisciplinary team approach. I feel like the, the PPAC program, the, the pain program for active coping and training that I'm involved in um, is, is uh, a true exemplar of integration. So while each of us the nur um, on the team, we have a nurse, a behavioral health coach, a physical therapist, and a pharmacist, and while each of us bring our unique unique skill set and our unique um, uh, scope um, to our work with a patient, what makes us truly integrated is we're all operating from the same knowledge of where we need to help the patient get to. So that really brings in a true integration. It isn't me as a nurse working in my silo. It isn't my behavioral health colleague working in his or her silo. We are truly creating an overlap because if, if we know that the foundation of what will be effective in pain care, if we're all operating from that per same, same perspective, we can't be siloed. We're all working towards the same goal. Um, I, uh, as I might have mentioned, the bulk of this program is um, carried out by the nurse and the behavioral specialist. Of course, we could not do this at all without our uh, physical therapy colleagues and our pharmacist colleagues. Um, I'll give a couple examples where um, the um, the, the physical therapist uh, brings forward their expertise and their knowledge in working with the patient, and then the nurse and the behavioral health coach continues that work with the patient because we're the ones engaging with the patient uh, every day, every week, every month. Um, there, uh, as I mentioned, the National Pain Strategy and a lot of work that the IOM has done and the NIH has done is really shifting this paradigm of care. Um, and as we look at what are some of the barriers keeping um, the pain care focused on uh, perhaps medications and procedures, and I think somebody mentioned it, it's truly the, the, the funding of what gets paid for in practice. Um, through this work um, on, on our team and other, other teams um, implementing the pragmatic trials, we've been able to sit down at the table with CMS and say, how do we create a structure for appointments that embed all these disciplines together? Um, how do we create a visit that, that, in, that that incorporates all these disciplines but does not charge the patient for every individual practitioner's time. So we're working with CMS on that because of the, 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 um, the strong uh, need for an uh, interdisciplinary approach. All right. So um, I'm going to start talking a little bit about the program, and, and, and as I talk about this, um, I'm really bringing forward things that I do as a nurse in the program, things that my nurse colleagues do in the program. Um, um, so I really want to present this as, I see this as best practice in, in, in managing and honoring those individuals with persistent pain. Um, so the National Pain Strategy um, encourages us to use a team-based approach and also a patient-centered approach. We can't make that um, management of that individual with persistent pain patient-centered unless we know the details of what's going on with them. So we, um, as you can see, we have multiple meetings with the patient. Um, it's interdisciplinary. The, 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 the nurse and, um, and the behavioral health coach are, are driving most of this. Um, we are looking to, of course, understand the pain characteristics um, that the patient is dealing with. Um, but and their, their pain history, how the pain developed, um, things as, as Dr. Schneider mentioned in terms of ACE and, and what have been experiences um, underlying that um, and what, um, 
you know, what treatments they have, have engaged in in the past, but just as importantly, we're looking at how are, they, how are they managing their pain? How are they coping with their pain? What are the unique life circumstances that make um, engaging in relaxation every day? What are the barriers to that? We're really learning about their whole life situation so that we can truly uh, um, target the program to work within their life. I feel like the nurse is just an optimal person to uh, dig into all these characteristics about the patient. Um, we, uh, I feel like nursing has a way of being able to truly understand the underlying biology of the pain, what's going on in the nurse, nervous system, as Dr. Schneider spoke to, uh, but also look at the, the psychological and the social components that are also impacting the patient's um, uh, experience of pain. Um, we, um, so we really work to understand what coping skills are they currently using? What are their, what is their support? What are their resources? Um, how have they managed chronic illness in the past? Um, um, some of those more actively engaged coping skills. Um, our physical therapist also meets with them. Um, um, another example of what, what makes us a true integrated inter interdisciplinary team is that um, the the physical therapy reviews the notes from, from the nurse before seeing the patient, and so then can really target their functional assessment of the patient, knowing what the patient needs to do in their daily life to, to have optimal well-being, to have optimal quality of life. So it's that true engagement. Um, after we gather a lot of information about the patient, we meet with the patient um, individually, um, a final time before we begin the, begin the group coaching and sit down and um, uh, integrate what we know about the patient's pain, their life, their coping abilities, and um, develop a plan of care moving forward. This is um, when I meet with a patient um, to do this at this kind of culmination of that, this very thorough uh, interdisciplinary intake series, I'm always checking out my assumptions that what I heard from the patient was a, a, indeed re representative of what the patient's experience is. And, um, and then working with them to set goals for moving forward, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how we do that. Um, so um, this plan is developed with the patient. As I mentioned, I'm meeting with that patient the, for that last time in that series of intake, um, intake visits. Um, that plan is then discussed with the primary care provider. That plan is then discussed with the primary care provider and the patient. So we kind of create this, this, um, this triad of a team uh, that's gonna be helping the patient to move forward. The, um, as I mentioned, we believe strongly, um, as does uh, endorsed in the National Pain Strategy, that, that uh, this management is embedded in primary care. So recognizing the important role of the primary care provider while also recognizing that the primary care provider, um, at, at least in the health system where I work, often has 2,000 patients on their panel. Um, so can't sit down to know all those individual nuance and things like that. And so um, after going through this planning with the patient, we meet with the primary care provider to make sure that we're all on the same page, to make sure that they know that the patient, the most important thing to the patient is um, uh, walking down the aisle um, when their daughter gets married. So really, really pulling together to understand what are the unique uh, characteristics of this patient's life? How can we work towards their goal together? Um, so we really integrate that with the, the, the primary care component. Um, this is um, uh, the bread and butter of this program is um, uh, working with patients on developing coping skills. We uh, work uh, very closely with who I think of as uh, the, the grand poobah of um, CBT and, and chronic pain, Frank Keefe. And um, we are working with the patient to help them uh, learn, practice, and implement the coping skills that are, um, that we know are, are crucial to managing persistent pain. So um, many of the coping skills that we talk about are listed here. Um, uh, Dr. Keefe just has this amazing way of in, in, um, engaging patients with that, which is the model that we use. So uh, we use a, a model similar to what Dr. Schneider spoke about is really helping the patient understand the, the physiology of pain, understanding that pain is not only the stimulus. Uh, we use the neuro matrix, uh, which states that um, we have these centers in the brain and the physiological experience and the social 
social experience and the psychological experience are impacting um, that, we don't say this to the patient, but, um, but impacting that descending inhibition. And so we really speak to the science and the understanding of why implementing these coping skills uh, every day is, is, is so important. Um, in managing the, the um, pathophysi pathophysiology of their pain. Uh, we make this a very um, experiential uh, work with the patient. So in the group setting, we are having the patient practice uh, the coping skills that they will then go and work at home. This is important for a couple reasons. It gives the patient the opportunity to practice, to um, have failures in that practice in a protective environment to uh, learn barriers to how that would be embedded in um, their daily life, um, and then to have success experiences in the group. And that their ability to have that success, success experience in the group is very much drives their ability to use that at home. So I, I truly believe this is an is a important model to work with, a very distinct from um, psychoeducation of pain, but really uh, working there with the patient to give them that success experience. Um, uh, we, uh, as I noted, we work with them to identify barriers to implementing those coping skills um, uh, at home, and then we develop a um, kind of a plan for their implementation at home to make sure that, um, that they are actually able to utilize this on their own because they're the ones with themselves uh, throughout the day. Um, this is where I feel like uh, uh, this is the, a nurse's bread and butter. They understand the dynamics of the patients, what the patient is dealing with, and, um, and how to help them integrate that at home. Um, we bring in an uh, integrative health component as recommended by the National Pain Strategy. Uh, we use a yoga-based adaptive movement. This is something where the, phys the physical therapist uh, works with the patient to understand what they can do, what they need to do, what, um, what they need to build the, the capacity to, to engage in their functions in everyday life. Um, the, the physical therapist makes uh, some rec recommendations on modifications, and then it's the nurse who works with the patient um, every single week um, in implementing this yoga-based adaptive movement um, to help the patient, but working from the knowledge of the physical therapist. Want to make sure I um, speak to um, the way that we do goal setting with the patient. Um, so uh, we use something called goal attainment scaling. We all know, as does the National Pain Strategy, that goal setting with our patients is critically important. It gives them something to work towards and takes puts their focus on the function and their ability to engage in life versus the pain intensity, which I think historically we have placed a lot of focus on. So goal attainment scaling, um, what we do with the patient was we have them identify a, um, a, a something that they wish they, that's very important to engage in, uh, in their life. Um, so for instance, being able to play with their grandkids when they come to visit. So we check in with the patient. We say, where are you in that goal right now? What is playing with your grandchildren when they come to visit look like? Well, it looks like I'm you know, having to sit in my special chair. The kids are playing on the ground. And, and, um, and, and that's as much as interaction as I have. So what we really work with the patient to determine um, Okay, if things looked a little bit better, what, did it, what would it look like? And patients often say, well, gosh, if things were just a little bit better, I'd be down on the floor, I'd be playing with them, it you know, we would be engaged. And then I always have to back up the patient. I say, okay, well, that's in the much better. Let's stage this a little. What if things were just a little? And so it's a process of helping the patient understand those small steps needed to take to get to the overarching goal. This is a really powerful thing. And then we bring this forward throughout the program. Again, uh, one of the nurses bread and butter is, is goal setting with patients. And I think it just takes this to the next level of really making that patient centered. Um, I'm gonna skip this. Let's see. So um, this will be the, the, last, the, the last component that I speak to. Um, this is, um, so we've spent a, a lot of time focusing on the, the zero to 10 pain scale and, um, and recognizing that that can mean different things for, for every single patient. And so what we've shifted this um, pain tracking over time to really look at 
functional activities that are important to the patient. So, um, so we really look at, okay, what's a problem that you're dealing with and what it would it look like if you were able to uh, better manage your pain and better work towards um, achieving your goals. And so, th so the patient sets their essential zero to 10 scale. They're setting their, their markers for improvement. So every time we check in with the patient, it's where are you on that? Is, are things a little bit better? Are they moderately better? And so that's how we're tracking pain over time. Uh, we know that oftentimes practitioners get into prescribing, um, it, it, uh, sequentially increasing the dose because the pain intensity might not be as managed as what the patient hopes. This shifts that dynamic to say, uh, what are the goals in your life? How can we stage them? And that's what we're gonna be checking in with to know whether your treatment is effective and where we need to go from there. So. Um, so in conclusion, I um, really want to reiterate, we have these guidelines of how to best manage persistent pain brought forth by the National Pain Strategy. The nurse is an integral comp component of this as they are truly able to in bring forward that bi biopsychosocial model of, of pain management. Thank you so much. So any questions or conversation points? Yeah, I think, yeah. So what is the preparation of the behavioral, the behavioral health specialist person? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, so the question was, what is the preparation of our behavioral health specialist in this program? Um, these are typically uh, social workers or licensed practical counselors. Um, um, we have, um, we have worked with behavioral specialists from addiction medicine, um, which has worked very well. Um, um, so we, we actually have a range. So they're all trained in the, in the behavioral aspect of um, chronic illness management. We actually, um, the people that we work with aren't necessarily specially trained in pain. We can accommodate that within our program. So, um, so either ba bachelor's or master's prepared. Um, I would say um, the um, social workers and licensed practical counselors are probably the majority of the, the individuals who work with us. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. Who else? Yes. Do you have any pain scales that you've utilized so, other than this one that you yeah, made? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this isn't very legible. Uh, so we, we do use the brief pain inventory. Um, uh, we have a... So in addition to the patient-specific uh, pain scales and outcome tracking, we do use the brief pain inventory. Uh, what I've found in my practice over the years is, is you know, the brief pain inventory is uh, 11 or 12 questions, depending on what version you use. And what I've found in my practice um, historically is that people are using the brief pain inventory, but oftentimes because of the need to consolidate that in practice, they ask the first three or four pain intensity questions. Um, so what we do is we use something called the PEGS. Um, it's been validated and, and um, against the brief pain inventory. It focuses on average pain intensity, that's the P, enjoyment of life, um, general activity and sleep. And so we really find it very important that out of the BPI, we're focusing on the functional aspects of it um, instead of focusing on the pain intensity aspect of it. There's been a lot of work to demonstrate that, um, that in, uh, um, uh, in pain care, we can oftentimes reduce the pain intensity only somewhat, but we can help patients become more functional. And that's truly what we want for our patients to engage them, to have, allow them and engage in their everyday life. So, uh, general activity. So pain average, enjoyment of life, that's the E, G is general activity, and S is sleep. Yeah, thank you. Other questions, yeah. I appreciate your approach on the stage because I think a lot of patients, like you said, they, they come to you in the general sense they don't feel like they've improved, but if you talk about the specifics of what they can and cannot exactly. do versus what they used to be able to do, yes. that's one. But two, I think it's really important 
for the medical culture to kind of do a mea culpa that we said, okay, I think I can help you with this pain, and it's one approach. So the whole public still has that perception that yes. the pill is my solution. Yes. This is, in, you know, this is, and it's cheaper. So yes. of course, CMS and everybody else kind of bought into that model. Absolutely. But I don't think if we, if we, the the, the organizational piece does not say, this was incorrect, and yeah. not only just research, but we have to, you know, sort of admit that there was a huge, yeah. you know, misconception about that. Yeah. Patients are not going to buy into their role. They're not going to buy into, you know, all those other things that go into it because you talk about obesity, you talk about all yeah. those things. Yeah. So I think, yes, this is very important. It's very important to have the team approach. But I think even when they come into my office as a primary care practitioner, it's just yeah. to say th that is not a realistic expectation and we have yeah. to start over with these small things that you're talking about yeah. because, again, then people's perception of what's happening to them changes. Absolutely, and, and what an important point, and I feel like I very much appreciate your perspective from the medical perspective. We have to say um, that, that we haven't always been following the, 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 the best proven approach for this. Um, so we're working to make that shift in paradigm, and as you said, the patient and the public are working to make that shift in paradigm, and so I really feel like so oftentimes we make so maybe we're able to understand that, and then we just assume that the patient is going to go along with it. No, we have to stop and talk about the um, the science behind this, or or or, or, or the, the the what's going on in their body, and why truly this is the best approach. We um, a lot of the, that series of intake visit is about establishing trust with the patient, so they've trusted us as practitioners, and um, for for some part, look 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 where it's gotten in them. And so uh, I, I really feel strongly that it is my responsibility to talk to the patient about why we're making this shift towards daily coping skills and, and, and lowering medications um, from what we've learned. Thank you so much for saying that. I agree. Yeah. I noticed that a lot of your stuff is centered around the patient. Yeah. Um, I guess my question would be, at what point do we allow the patient to start making decisions yeah. versus doctors that think they know everything? I mean, I was polypharmacied by the VA by a doctor, a primary care doctor, yeah. that thought they knew what was best for me. Yeah. At what point do we allow the patients and the pain patients to make these decisions? Because obviously your approach is not working. Yeah. I'm supposed to yeah. trust you because you have a 12-year degree, Absolutely. but I'm the one in pain. Yep. And I may go to a primary care doctor and I may say, hey, this is what's going on. But you said it yourself, they have too many patients. Mm -hmm. Me expecting him to actually care about me yeah. Yeah. is few and far between. He may say he does, but I'm one of 2,000 patients. So mm -hmm. at what point in your model are you addressing, yes, we're about the patient, but the patient actually needs to have a voice because I've been overridden by my doctor numerous times. Yeah. I'm sick. I don't feel good. Uh, this one makes me dizzy. They put me on four medications. I ended up in the yeah. Billings Clinic with a failed kidney and liver. Wow. I mean, is that, is, that, is that what we're trying to do? Because at what point in your model is the patient getting an active voice? Because mm -hmm. if I'm there with four other medical professionals, they're all going to know what's best for me. Yeah, and only I know what's best for me. So I guess we need to maybe address that. And I also noticed an age gap. You know, you're up there and you're talking about elderly and pain management, but there's a whole new generation of people coming in yeah. that have different tolerances to pain, different situations. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, let's what, include everybody in that yeah. discussion. And what great questions. Thank you so much. And, and so the question of when do we involve the patient right now? And, and, and that is at the beginning of our program. Um, as I spoke about the, the work with the patient to develop the plan of care, it's surrounded about them. It's about me learning what what are their needs? What hasn't worked in the past? And so I have a firm belief that um, that work with the patient, that integration, it's not about me telling the patient what to do. We know that doesn't work. It, it has to come from the patient. So it's truly in the beginning working as a team with the patient to determine what's going to work. Um, uh, the other, your other point of, um, of um, so one, we need to shift that model of care. It's not the expert and, and, and the person who needs it. It's, it's us working together. I think the other component that you're speaking to is, um, is the, um, believing this it needs to happen in primary care, but recognizing that the primary care provider doesn't have all the time in the world. And so this model um, operates on a medical home model. Now, 
um, where I work, we don't have medical homes implemented yet, as I imagine perhaps some places in Montana don't have that either. And so this is really creating that medical home. So it's not only, you're not only working with the primary care provider, but you're working with the nurse and the behavioral specialist and, and the physical therapist. And that's really to say that, um, okay, if we know this is what what best manages persistent pain. Um, how do I work with you to know what that looks like in your life? Because um, it's really your life that's gonna dictate how, how you're able to use those strategies. So I'm grateful for your question and um, I truly hope in this, in this shift of care, um, as we bring this uh, more holistic approach that, that uh, uh, hardworking patients such as yourself uh, feel that partnership from the medical community as well. Thank you. What? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I discovered that so many of these patients have are dis I've discovered that so many of these patients are discouraged because they have been living so long with their chronic pain and most of them have become disabled and they no longer have work, they no longer have money. So what kind of resources, what kind of encouragement can we give them so that they feel like, okay, this is something else to try? Because they do get discouraged. They go, well, I don't have any money. My insurance isn't going to cover this. My Medicare isn't going to cover this. What do I do? Where can I go? How can I even go forward yeah. to reach this? And so how can you even begin to encourage people at this level? It's, it's a great question. And you're right that many of the individuals with persistent pain that I work with are extremely, extremely frustrated. And I would say the majority of the patients that I work with are um, younger individuals, middle-aged individuals at the height of their, you know, what would be their working capacity. And so um, I think the first thing that we have to do is help them recognize that they, they, um, they do have ability in this situation. And, and, and that's why our model really works with them um, uh, face to face to, to give them um, to help them develop self-efficacy in their capability to start making progress. And so it's small steps. So we're first uh, working with the patient to see that, gosh, I can use these skills. That means that I can do the activities at home. Okay, now I'm, now I'm increasing my function at home. That means that then I can take that next step to perhaps volunteer. Well, now I'm volunteering and I'm able to, well, now I can take those next steps to, to get back into the workforce. So I really firmly believe Believe. I know it probably sounds like, um, gosh, that's going to take a huge long trajectory. But if we're showing patients that, that they have the tools they need, but they haven't had the guidance from, from myself included, from the medical community um, at first, if we're helping them get, have those success experiences, have them see how this can be effective, how it can work in their individual lives, with their individual circumstances, with their kids, with juggling soccer practice, with, with the needs of their family, um, I truly have seen uh, people then re-engage um, in volunteering, re-engage in the workforce. And I think your point that, um, that so often the, the, the patients who, who I see are so disillusioned by the medical, medical system because it truly has failed them in the past. And, and, and so I think it's our responsibility to show that um, we're shifting a paradigm in, in how we're caring for them, how we're working with them, not treating them, but working with them. And I think it can be incredibly powerful. Thank you. Anything else? Hello, my name is Terry Anderson, and I wanted to introduce Casey Brock. He introduced the Montana Pain Patient Bill of Rights before the Montana legislature. Wow. And I suffer adhesive arachnoiditis. Lost my career as a civil engineer, and I could teach the course on cognitive behavioral therapy, because if I didn't use my mind um, to address intractable suicide level pain, Absolutely. I wouldn't be here. Absolutely. But it, this model is failing the patients, because there's another piece to this central pain syndromes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and neuroinflammation in the spinal cord. And so this needs to be addressed. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and thank you. And thank you to, for, for all your hard work. And, and I'm, I'm grateful for your um, uh, working with others to recognize that um, that mind does play a powerful effect. That does not in any way mean that the pain originates in the mind. That is a, a false notion. But as we know about the, the um, 
uh, how the central nervous system works and the descending inhibitory uh, pathway, those strategies are physiologically um, um, interrupting that, that pain signal. So it, it's an incredibly uh, important capacity and, um, and takes some trust in working with the patient um, and, 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 how, and, and not suggesting that this is in your head because it's absolutely not. We know that it's embedded in the nervous system, but there are strategies um, um, it, it, as, we, as we know about how the nervous system works that those, those uh, cognitive strategies can be incredibly helpful. Anything else? Did you have a question, sir? Well, not ideal. Um, just was wondering, has this approach, or have, are you in the different areas um, using this through telehealth? And how's, and how's that going? Just with we having so many rural providers who might not have all these resources uh, at local aid, just was wondering how that might work. Absolutely, it's a great question. So. Um, we have not yet rolled out this program in, in terms of telehealth. Um, my work with uh, Frank Keefe uh, actually does a lot of telehealth in, in most of the principles that, I, that I've been uh, speaking to. Um, the, the, so yes, this model can absolutely work in telehealth. Oftentimes the barriers are, um, as you likely know, sometimes the, the lowest common denominator of the, um, of the system that provider and patient are using, that, that's, that's, that's what drives it. Um, so because so much of this is working with the patient and, and, and um, in terms of a nurse working with the patient or a behavioral specialist working with the patient and then helping the patient then do it on their own, it's, it's actually ideal for something where the patient can't come into a tertiary health center every week. And so I really do believe the principles and the coping skills and the engagement with the patient um, truly function very well in a telehealth model. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just, just would like to remind everyone for the questions, please wait for the um, microphone. This is being recorded, and so it's wonderful we can get those questions recorded uh, for people to review online after. Um, next, I will uh, introduce Anita harper Poe, who will introduce our next uh, speaker. She was one of our council members uh, specializing in healthcare law. Good morning. Thanks, Mark. Um, my name is Anita Harper Poe. I'm an attorney at Garlington Lawn and Robinson here in town. In my practice, I represent healthcare providers and physicians. And I am just, uh, uh, I guess I'm the token uh, lawyer on the planning council. And I'm here to introduce um, two speakers who are going to talk about the next subject, which is physical therapy management of complex res uh, persistent pain. Um, first, we have Christian Appel. Um, who graduated from the University of Montana in 1991 and um, has a transitional doctorate of physical therapy from EIM. He's co-owner and founder of Great Northern Physical Therapy in Bozeman, Montana, and a faculty affiliate in the School of Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Sciences here at the University of Montana. He's vice president of the Montana chapter of APTA and while not in the office, he's searching for grizzly bears, which sounds like trouble. Um, and there's a theme here because our second speaker is Dan McCarthy. Dr. McCarthy um, is just about to finish the third year of a family practice or family medicine residency, the, the program here. Um, and he is the academic chief in the residency program. He uh, is a doctor of osteopathy, and he trained as a wildlife biologist before go getting interested in medicine, chasing grizzly bears. So I don't know what the theme is for these physical therapy people, but he's, Dr. McCarthy's about to go off to a an, um, fellowship in Oregon um, for osteopathy, and they will be talking to you about physical therapy approaches. Awesome. So. Yeah, my, my talk is physical therapy treatment of complex persistent pain. Um, pretty much what we've all been talking about. The uh, way I treat complex persistent pain is integrating a biopsychosocial approach into graded activity and graded motor imaging. Um, I'll try to paint a picture of what this looks like uh, by briefly describing what the first three visits of my patient encounter may look like. Um, and as you can see from the pain drawing there, we've all seen pain drawings like this. 
it's difficult to put a pathoanatomical or a biomedical diagnosis to explain those uh, pain drawings. Um, so to begin my uh, initial visit, it is, I, I do a thorough neurovascular and musculoskeletal exam. It is guided by this, what I refer to as the sins of, the, of their complaints. The sins is the severity, and the, the severity of the symptoms, which is what is the effect, what are the symptoms effect on the patient's function? And that is ultimately what physical therapists, we are looking at our ability to improve patient function. The irritability of the patient, the amount of an aggravating activity to provoke the symptoms, and the amount and intensity of the symptoms provoked, um, and also the time it takes for those provoked symptoms to return to their resting level. Um, the nature of the symptoms, what is the hypothesis regarding the underlying um, source of the symptoms, and also the contributing factors. Once again, bringing in that biopsychosocial approach, um, the stage of the, of the, which is the progression of the symptoms or progression of the disorder over time, um, and the stability the consistency of the distribution of the symptoms um, and consistency of movement or resting capabilities. So on visit one, once I said I, I performed the examination, after the examination, I, I discuss with the patient my findings and obviously and often there are impairments in strength and range of motion. And I also recognize, I talk to the patient and say, so by and large, you've had pain for X number of years, you're on all these medications, you haven't returned to work, the medical system has failed you. Right, right there, that statement seems to get the patient's buy-in. What does this guy have that's different than, he's recognizing it's failed me, what does this guy have that's, uh, that's different? Um, you know, I talked to them about, yes, I have found impairments in your strength and range of motion, but if I jump in there and just start giving you three sets of 10 of this exercise or that exercise, I'm going to be added to that list of providers that has, has failed you. So um, I, I go into a great deal of neuroscience pain education with my patients to help them understand um, their unique pain experience. Uh, on the first visit, I, I have on my website uh, a great deal of pain resources. I direct them to my web website, and an assignment on day one is to watch the first two pain videos. Uh, first one is uh, understanding pain and what to do about in five minutes. It's, there's nothing rock and science in there, but it's a good basic understanding. And then there's a 14-minute TED Talk by Dr. Lorimer Mosley which I have them watch also. I also instruct them, as you are watching these videos, write down any questions that come up about your unique pain experience and how this information applies to me. We will answer those at the next appointment. I also give them this assignment. What is it that you would like to do in one month that you are not doing now either due to pain or fear of pain. It's the answer to this question that will provide the meaningful framework for, and goals for the patient's uh, graded motor act, or, or you know, graded activity. Um, once again, there's a website, a couple videos that I uh, instruct them to watch. Uh, vis on visit two, I do expect them to watch those, and the first I started out by answering their questions of, regarding their own unique pain experience regarding uh, the two videos, and I continue getting further in depth with my neuroscience pain education. Uh, particularly, I talk about what we call the tissue tolerance line. If you exceed this tissue tolerance line, an injury does occur. I also talk about what we refer to as a protect by pain line. In a normal, I'll, I'll go into that here in just a little bit more. I also talk a great deal about 
uh, sensitization of the nervous system and the adaptive changes that have occurred within, within the brain. Uh, and I also get the answer to the question posed on the first visit. And they are provided with a book or CD of Explained Pain, which is written by Drs. David Butler and Lorimer Bosley. It's a five-hour assignment, and they are expected to watch that. And I would say by far the vast majority of my patients, they are now being equipped with tools that they can help be involved in the process. I have great buy-in patients uh, reading or, or listening to that, that book. So I don't know if anyone's seen the cover of the book. That's Explain pain. Uh, so here, let's talk about this uh, normal pain processing. We have this tissue tolerance line that sits up here. In a normal, healthy person, we have this protect by pain line. We will perceive pain just prior to uh, crossing that tissue tolerance threshold. If we listen to our bodies, we will back off before we have pain. That's in a normal, healthy person acute pain experience. In individuals with persistent pain who have experienced sensitization, the tissue tolerance line sits up here. The protect by pain line has fallen way down here. We get pain that is very real pain way before we are at any threat of causing an actual injury or harm to our tissues. If we cross that protect by pain line, we do have a flare-up, which is a very real experience, often requiring a change in your medications, change in your activity, a day off of work. What we need to do is utilize our graded activity to help push that protect by pain line up near, closer to the tissue tolerance line. This is how physical therapists can be involved in improving function. Uh, here are factors influencing the, the individualized graded activity. The patient's individual functional goal. Remember I asked that question on, on day one. What is it that you would like to be able to do in one month that you are not doing now, either due to pain or fear of pain? Uh, and then is getting more of this biopsychosocial, connecting with the patient, the patient-centered approach is what is preventing them from currently achieving this goal? Is it pain? Is it fear of pain? Is it some of the musculoskeletal impairments that I found during my objective examination? Oh. My next goal in creating this uh, graded activity is what is the level of activity they can safely perform currently? So I'm going to use walking as just a simple example. A person tells me that they, I think I can walk 10 minutes without aggravating my symptoms. Okay, I'm great. We're going to cut that in half. We're going we're to have you do a purposeful five minutes of walking on a daily basis. So we're beginning well below their safety zone because we do not want to go through this. We do not want to be producing routinely these flare-ups. Okay, uh, Every three days that they are able to uh, perform that activity without increasing or, or aggravating their symptoms, the volume of the activity is increased, okay? So say, let's say their functional goal was, I would like to be able to go for a one hour hike in a month, okay? They can walk 10 minutes, I'm starting at five. Every three days, we are increasing that volume. So it looks like this. By slowly increasing the volume of an activity, whichever functional activity is important to them, we can, we can gradually push that protect by pain line up to where it, where it needs to be, okay? Uh, so the day two assignment is begin the individualized graded activity program, read or listen to explain pain within the next week. It's a five hour assignment, five hours to complete. Uh, and then on, I, I work right next to the Bozeman Public Library, there is a, a magazine recycle bin there, so people can, they're done with their magazines, they can go drop them off there, and anyone else can go pick them up. So I tell them, on your way out of here, go pick up a magazine and circle a handful of activities 
that you are fearful of performing. This is the first step involved in developing the graded motor imaging plan or program as part of this, uh, this approach. Uh, so once again, day three, continue monitoring their understanding of neuroscience pain education. I review the principles of graded activity. Uh, graded motor imaging ac exercise is now instituted. We pick one of the circled images in the magazine and I discuss, you know, what is it about this image that produces fear or pain? And then I, we go through a, a guided imagery exercise, which is nothing more than imagining the movement. They are not performing the movement. Once again, I, I preface this often with imaging training is a very powerful tool. There's not a single Olympian who has won a gold medal who has not imagined every step of the race, every step of whatever activity. It is a very powerful tool. And uh, there are two types of imaging. There's implicit and explicit uh, graded uh, motor imaging. For sake of time, I am going to just visit with you a little bit about the explicit. Uh, this is when you are, are cognizant that you are mentally moving. Uh, this, the, by just imagining movement, primary motor cortex cells are activated. And, but one thing that you need to be aware of, because primary motor cortex cells are activated, just imagining the movement can produce pain. And you may need to alter this activity. And that's, at that point in time, I need to step back into what we call implicit motor imaging. And for the sake of time, I'll be available for questions and talk about me. And I need to leave time for my colleague here. Um, so assignment, as we continue with the progression of graded activity and the graded motor imaging exercise. And just for a quick example, if let's say the person's fearful activity is bending forward. I, they sent a, they brought in a magazine. There's a, there's a young lady bending forward, standing in the grass, bare feet, petting her pet. You can see that the wind is blowing through her hair. I start with, okay, you can see in this image. Let's close your eyes. The sun is shining. Feel the warmth on your shoulders. You can see that her hair is blowing in the wind. Feel the breeze on your face. Feel the breeze through your hair. Feel, feel the breeze on the skin. On your, feel the grass. So I start with the things that are very not, not threatening and slowly move towards uh, imagining the motion, imagining the movement, and, and then stressing. Now I want you to imagine yourself being successful with this activity. I send them home uh, trying to do, do the same with uh, other images. Uh, this is a excellent text by uh, the authors on graded motor imaging, other parts of graded motor imaging that we can utilize and has been very successful patients with uh, CRIPS is mirror therapy, but that's beyond the scope of this talk right now. Uh, ask physical therapists. This is a new tagline just published last this this week, I think, by the uh, physical therapists or APTA. And here are some references. And I hope I left Dan enough time. So I went through pretty quickly. So I'll be available for questions afterwards. Dan. Oh yeah. I just learned that Dan was into grizzly bears last night at dinner, and so. We were showing pictures on our phones back and forth, so. Thank you, Christian. Okay. So my name's Dr. Daniel McCarthy. Uh, I work down the road at Partnership Health Center. I am an almost board certified osteopath. Uh, and I find that this is kind of an overwhelming task because I'm following national pain experts, um, following you know, speakers for the Department of Health and Human Resources, and I'm an almost board certified family physician from down the road. So, so why 
did the committee think that I had some value to add to this? I think it, it really is because of what's happened at Partnership Health Center down the road. So Partnership Health Center is the base uh, for the Family Medicine Residency of Western Montana. It's also a patient-centered medical home. It's also a federally qualified health center. So, you know, kind of some of the things Dr. Lancaster was talking about are happening right here in Missoula, and I've been able to, to be a part of that. Um, Dr. Mattel is our osteopathic program director. I'd like to thank him for, for giving me this opportunity to speak on uh, a topic that's, that's very near and dear to me, which is osteopathy's role in pain. So, so basically what's happened down the street at Partnership Health Center is the residency, the residency has been implemented, uh, behavioral health has been integrated, pharmacy has been integrated, and about 30% of the residents are osteopaths. And so osteopathy has been an important part of the multimodal approach to chronic pain as well as other disease processes uh, right here in Missoula. All right, so I just want to give a brief overview of what this talk is about. I want to give everybody a, a little bit of a framework for what is osteopathy, how osteopaths can be a part of this multimodal approach to chronic pain, uh, what are some of the risks and benefits of our treatment, and, and who's a good candidate, and how do you find some of those resources. So this photograph is also my, my shameless attempt to keep this talk more interesting. Uh, in a previous life, I, I did wildlife research uh, in the Greater Teton National Forest in Wyoming. Um, this is a picture after a mountain lion capture in Collar. Uh, this is kind of a famous mountain lion. Uh, he weighed over 200 pounds in his prime uh, and lived to old age and died of disease. So it was, it was kind of a, a good story. All right, so the framework of osteopathy. Um, osteopathy is a mode of medicine that's based on three simple principles. And within those three principles, um, it's immensely complex. Uh, but basically, these three principles are the body as a unit. Uh, we've been talking a lot about um, the nervous system, the tissue, the individual, and, and what they need. Uh, and that's all incorporated into that first principle. The second principle is the body is capable of self-regulation and healing. I think we've been talking about a lot of procedures and, and some fancy things that modern medicine can do, but I haven't seen an orthopedic surgeon heal a bone yet or I haven't seen a trauma surgeon put tissue back together yet that isn't 100% reliant on that patient to heal the wound and heal the trauma. The third principle, structure and function are interrelated. If the, if the structure is off, the function will be off. If the function is off, the structure will be off. The fourth principle really is just an incorporation of the first three principles. Um, all rational treatment is based on these three principles, that the body is a unit, the body can heal, and the structure and function need to be uh, in good working relationship um, for the patient to do well. And this really is of primary importance in pain, but also in other disease processes. All right, so just a little bit of, of, about the human body. I think really where osteopaths shine is we are students of the human body, students of life, and students of, of the, the person as a unit. So we really think of the human as a really complex machine. Uh, an amazing machine, a machine that can heal itself, um, a machine that we have not come close to inventing uh, in any other way. So to compare another complex machine, I picked a Rolex watch. Uh, I think the moving parts and pieces of a Rolex watch are a good demonstration of, of a complex machine. So a Rolex watch has 115 pieces. If one piece in a Rolex watch moves, every piece has to move. Now let's compare that to kind of the amazing complex machine of the human body. The human body has 11 organ systems, 206 bones. It actually starts with 270 bones, but through processes of fusion through development, we end with 206. 60,000 miles of blood vessels, 100 billion neurons, maybe a few less for some of us, <laughs> and 37.2 trillion cells. I don't know about you guys, but my 100 billion neurons can hardly comprehend my 37.2 trillion cells. I think this slide highlights why is pain so complex? Um, because the human body is so complex. <clears throat> All right. So this is another picture of a mountain lion who I like to think of is really contemplating the mysteries of the universe and the mysteries of chronic pain uh, through those deep blue eyes. All right. 
so I think everyone here is pretty well versed in, in the complexity of pain. But what I see in daily practice in our clinic is a lot of people are doubting pain. I don't know if this patient's pain is real, and I think that's because of the undertones of addiction to medicine and, and all the complexities that go into chronic pain. But I think, I think we have to trust our patients, and pain is subjective. If they tell us we have pain, they have pain, then we have to believe them and, and, and treat them accordingly. Um, and pain is a signal, even chronic, that something is off. It may be off emotionally, it may be off in the tissue, but something is off for that patient. Pain's variable over time. Um, trying to tell someone they need to do the same thing for their pain every day doesn't necessarily make sense when some days their pain is okay and some days their pain is terrible. I think really the focus of, of osteopaths is pain is made worse by structural disease, as is most, most pathology. But pain is extremely complex and it needs a multimodal approach and osteopathy is part of that multimodal approach. All right, and just to go into a little bit more detail about why is pain so complex? How is pain so complex? I think the migraine is, is an excellent example of that. So what causes a migraine? Does anybody have a great idea? So I thought I'd go to kind of this, the most comprehensive medical resource up to date and look up the pathophysiology of a migraine. I was taught in medical school that a migraine is caused by primary vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Uh, the vasodilation leading to pain and the vasoconstriction leading to aura. It turns out that's not right. Uh, the once popular theory of migraine, which suggests the migraine headache was caused by dilation of blood vessels and the aura by vasoconstriction is no longer considered viable. Okay, so what is viable? Well, now what they found is that there's actually a cortical spreading depression. So there's a sequential firing of neurons that spreads through the brain. And I think they're probably right. But what causes a migraine? None of that has anything to do with the cause of a migraine. Why have so many brilliant people failed to find the cause of a migraine? And I think the reason is humans are so complex. The machine is so complex. Every individual's migraine may be caused by something different. They may lead to vasodilation, vasoconstriction, and cortical uh, spreading depression, but that doesn't get down to the cause. All right. I think the reason I put that slide in there is because osteopathic treatments are individualized to every patient. And Oftentimes, that allows us to get to the cause of the pain and sometimes eliminate chronic pain long term. So what initiates most chronic pain? In Montana, everybody has an amazing trauma story. Montanans are rough and tumble rancher people, and, and a lot of their pain started with, with traumas. And that's really where osteopaths shine. Almost every patient that I come into contact with has a story about what started their pain. It was a car accident. It was a bend and twist. It was a slip and fall. A lot of it has to do with trauma. And that's not to say that emotional distress and other things can't cause pain. Who can go through a car accident or any other traumatic, painful experience without having a lot of emotional uh, layers and overlay? So I thought I'd throw a couple other pictures of Montana trauma. <laughs> Anyone who's been in St. Pat's uh, during the summer and worked on the trauma service realizes that about 50% of the people in the hospital fell off a horse, got kicked by a horse, or had some sort of horse trauma. <clears throat> and how many of us have a lot of patients who were injured on the job. I have a lot of patients who go over the Dakotas, work in the oil fields, and, and they've had significant traumas uh, related to their work. Sports injuries. How many people have a, a friend who has a story about their glory days in 1987 running a football down the field and hurting their shoulder, and it's still bothering them 20 years later? Um, and then, and then phys physical degeneration. So now I'm going to get into a little bit about how osteopathy thinks about all these traumas and what to do about them and, and their subsequent uh, symptoms. So the body is amazingly adaptable and has the ability to compensate for these traumas. So everything starts with a trauma. I think this is a great picture of, of two large, very powerful men inflicting trauma on each other. You can see the force entering the body. That force is going to imprint on the tissue, imprint on the body, and the entire body is going to have to compensate. Just to elaborate on that a little bit based on this picture, you can see the forces rotating the head to the right. 50% of the rotation of the neck comes at the atlantoaxial joint. What if that joint gets stuck 10% to the right? What's going to happen to the rest of the body? Is he going to walk around with his head facing 10 degrees to the right? Probably not. The entire body is going to compensate. The rest of the body is going to rotate the head back, although that joint slots that motion, which is going to force the entire body into a new compensation pattern. This is another example of that in, in a, 
much more common scenario. Not all of us get punched uh, in the face by very large, powerful men. So an ankle sprain. Who knows somebody who's rolled their ankle? Who has rolled their ankle? Probably all of us. Well, here's an example. This diagram on the left shows what happens to the rest of the body with an ankle sprain. An inversion ankle sprain, the talus gets rotated internally. Well, we're not going to walk around with an internally rotated talus, so what's going to happen? We're going to straighten the leg out, which is going to externally rotate the tibia. Relative to the femur, that's going to internally rotate the femur, which is going to put the torque right into the pelvis. So the entire body has to compensate for that rotated talus. Well, what happens if we don't have a lot of ability to compensate? Say I have a lot of osteophytes, I have narrow joint spaces, my neural foramina are very narrow. You can look at the picture on the left of the screen, or on the right of the screen, and, and see what happens to the body and how it compensates. So the pelvis is off. We went through what happens with the leg. The talus internally rotates, tibia externally rotates, femur internally rotates, puts a torque through the sacrum, which puts the sacrum on an unlevel platform. Well, now the rest of the spine has to, to compensate with a slight twisting pattern in order to keep the head level, because we're not going to walk around with our head rotated to the right or our head tilted crooked. So now we have a slight sway in the back, which is great. A lot of people can sprain their ankle, put a slight sway in their back, and it's not going to lead to any pain. But if you've had multiple traumas in the past, age, lots of degeneration, um, you may not have the wiggle room to put that sway in your back. It may lead to pinched nerves. It may lead to increased myofascial pain. Um, so everybody's pain is unique, and it's unique because of the life that they've lived. All the traumas that have gone into their body, all the emotional overlay, um, every single trauma that goes in is a new layer on all those other issues of life. All right, so how can osteopaths help? Our focus is really to look at an individual and try and bring the health out in that individual. If, if a person with terrible cervical arthritis is having a lot of pain after an ankle sprain, I'm going to try and fix their ankle sprain. I'm not going to be able to fix their cervical arthritis, but I may be able to get their body in a better pattern so their cervical arthritis is no longer bothersome. So the, the main goals of osteopathy are to help the complex human machine thrive in health. How do we do that? We get rid of as much tissue tension as possible. We take a lifelong trauma history, broken bones, concussions, car accidents, and we look in common areas uh, for tissue tension. We also focus on the areas uh, where patients are having pain. We increase blood flow. If there's a big twist in the fascia, not only is that going to put direct pressure on the capillaries, the arteries, and the veins, it's also going to, your, your nervous system is brilliant. It's going to sense that there's a twist. You're going to have too much sympathetic tone which sympathetic tone is our fight or flight nervous system, that's going to cause the blood vessels to constrict. It's going to limit the blood flow to that area, which is going to limit the oxygen to that area, which is going to limit that tissue's ability to heal. And this can be 20, 30 years down the road. Um, after an injury, you can still have decreased blood flow. Nerve flow. How many patients have neuropathy? How much neuropathy doesn't quite make perfect sense with some other primary nerve problem? A lot of it is the nerves are being irritated um, by fascia, by muscle, um, and they can't flow properly due to all that extra tension. Lymphatic flow. How many patients have chronic swelling in a joint? If that swelling can't come out, what is that tissue's ability going to be to heal? So our goals are to maximize the health of that patient by max maximizing the complex machine's normal function. Also, I just wanted to mention glymphatic flow. Glymphatic flow is such a new concept that PowerPoint wouldn't let me spell it correctly. It kept underlining it in red. Um, so I'm just going to touch base on that just to kind of put it on everybody's radar. So what is osteopathic medicine? It's mechanical medicine for mechanical disease. It's part of a multimodal approach with behavioral health, with medication, to, to sort of try and get more at the root of how complex pain is and to address primarily the mechanical uh, component of the disease. Although I, I would say with hands-on treatments, there's also a very psychologically beneficial therapeutic relationship that's established as well. So it can, it can start to get into other realms as well. So osteopathic medicine are hands-on treatment. There's a million different uh, modalities, different techniques, different practitioner styles. Um, but generally, they're all hands-on treatment, and, and the goal is 
to, to tone down the nervous system, decrease the tissue tension, increase the body's normal function. So as, as we normalize the structure, the goal is to enhance the function. As the function increases, almost all pathology will decrease. That goes from migraines to chronic pain to seizures to almost anything. If we can get the complex machine functioning better, pathology will decrease and we'll put them in a healthier state. All right, so Dr. Mantel is probably laughing because he hears me drone on about the glymphatic system nonstop at the residency program. So just to put this on your radar, I don't want to get into too much detail. We've talked a lot about dysregulated nervous systems in people with chronic pain. So this system, the glymphatic system, it's the lymphatic system to the brain. And it was discovered by Jeffrey Liff about two years ago, and a lot of interesting science has come of it. But basically what it is, cerebral spinal fluid, we were all taught, is, is developed at the choroid plexus and the ventricles, flows through the ventricular system, out the brain, and basically back into the bloodstream through the arachnoid granulations. What Jeffrey Liff discovered by injecting radio tracers into cerebral spinal fluid, it's much more complex than that. What actually happens is the CSF follows the penetrating arteries into the brain parenchyma, washes across the brain parenchyma, and cleans metabolic waste away from the brain. It's very difficult for a nervous system to be healthy if it's plugged up with metabolic waste. So just a couple points about the glymphatic system. The blood-brain barrier doesn't necessarily apply to the glymphatic system. Uh, this, the CSF directly communicates with the cervical lymph node chains, et cetera. They found that it follows the dura out the, the facial nerves, probably going to follow the dura out the spinal nerves as well. Uh, so those barriers aren't quite as rock solid as we thought. They've proven that the CSF washing across the parenchyma washes away beta amyloid and tau protein, which has a lot to do with neurodegenerative diseases as well as just an unhealthy brain. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy, a lot of that looks like beta amyloid buildup. So if this system isn't functioning properly, the, the, the nervous system is not going to be in a healthy condition. Sleep. Why do we need to sleep? That's a fundamental question, right? And the glymphatic system is a primary component to that. They've proven that our glymphatic system flows six times more while we sleep. We need to sleep so the brain can rest and wash away all the metabolic waste from, from wakefulness. So the next slide is just a little bit of credit where credit is due. This is Andrew Taylor Still. He's the, the mythical legend of osteopathy. He, he lived in the late 1800s and developed most of the techniques that are still being used today. Just to give him credit, this glymphatic system was discovered two years ago. He describes it in Philosophy of Osteopathy in 1898 almost perfectly. This is William Garland, Garland Sutherland. He's kind of the Einstein of osteopathy. He took Dr. Still's teaching, really developed it into a complex model. If you read Dr. Sutherland's writings on the human skull, you'll really appreciate the complex machine and how much our skull is just like a Rolex watch. Every part moves together in kind of a, a beautiful symphony. All right, so everybody's falling asleep after a little glymphatic talk, so I thought I'd throw another mountain lion picture up. Uh, I worked in, in Wyoming for three years, and my job was to capture, collar, and follow mountain lions to learn about uh, demographics, reproduction, and really just to give the game and fish a really thick packet to throw in the trash can. But this is a be beautiful picture. This is a picture for uh, my 15 minutes of fame. This is a, a female mountain lion who had a family with her and we got a collar on her. This photograph was um, on a National Geographic website. If you scrolled all the way to the bottom of the National Geographic site two years ago, it was about this big as a little thumbnail at the bottom. So that's my claim to fame. All right. So what are the risks of osteopathy? I think we all know the risks of historical pain management. Um, as far as addiction, GI bleeding, lots of other issues. I think that's really why pain has become such a difficult problem is because as providers, we're torn on how to help this patient because we know our treatments have so many side effects and so many issues. Um, and really, osteopathy is kind of like uh, CBT. Um, there's not really many side effects. In the right hands, the side effects are going to be similar to a long run. The patient's going to be sore. The body is in a comfortable spot unless they're having a lot of pain. But we're going to change that compensation 
and the body's gonna be sore as it goes through that compensation pattern, as the body realigns and readjusts. Uh, occasionally headaches, things like that, but generally it's an extremely safe and effective treatment. I just wanted to put a little bit on how to access, because traditionally, the best osteopaths have sort of gotten a little clinic, been in a back closet somewhere, and been doing great work, and nobody knows how to get to them or where they're at or what they're doing. So this slide is just to emphasize that there are a lot of great osteopaths here. Uh, right down the road at Partnership Health Center, there's a lot of really inspired residents who are doing a lot of great work. Uh, osteopathic.org is a great way to find osteopaths. Um, cranialacademy.org. Uh, the Missoula Osteopathic Clinic is right here in Missoula as well. Uh, they're doing a lot of good osteopathic work. Uh, Montana Spine and Pain has two osteopaths working there. And then I have to give a shout out to Partnership Health Center, Dr. Mantel, who's our osteopathic program director. Uh, it's good to see Dr. Reed here as well. All right, who's a good candidate uh, for an osteopathic treatment? Anyone who says, my pain or pathology started with X, car accident, ski accident, football tackle, whatever it might be, there's at least likely a mechanical component to their pathology, to their trauma. Uh, anyone who has obvious structural dysfunction. If you see your patient walk in the office and their shoulders are asymmetric, they can barely walk, their one hip's externally rotated, whatever it might be, osteopaths can help take out that strain, help get the patient in a better function, better function and a better structure. Uh, anyone who's been refractory to standard treatment. This is a totally different approach uh, to trying to help with their pain. Uh, some of the best successes that I've had as a resident have been patients that have seen everyone else and nobody addressed the mechanical component, and that was the primary component to their pain. Uh, I think it's good to set up sort of patient goals. If you have an 87-year-old who has terrible arthritis and everywhere else, the goals are going to be maintenance. The goals are going to help her compensate month by month uh, and decrease her pain. Um, and if you have a young patient who has an acute trauma, the goal is to get that strain out so they never, never develop issues of chronic pain. All right, what, what should you expect uh, if you go to an osteopath? How many visits, how long, et cetera? Uh, so we take a, a full history of physical, and generally my focus is a lifetime trauma history. Because of those overlying layers of pathology and tissue tension and trauma, sometimes you have to go back 20 years to falling out of the back of a truck at age 14 because they were pushed by their friend. Um, it's a hands-on treatment, so patients that are comfortable um, with the hands-on treatment and people being uh, in their personal space. Um, usually, it's gonna be three to six treatments. I tell patients I get three tries uh, to make a meaningful difference in this, and then after the third treatment, we'll have a meaningful discussion to, to decide uh, the future course of treatment. Just one more point. Um, we do focus a lot on lifestyle modification. If you increase blood flow, you increase nerve flow, you decrease the tissue tension, but there's a lot of depression, they're not sleeping, the diet is terrible. That's all gonna limit the body's ability to heal from those traumas and, and move towards a healthier compensation pattern. So that's really where our physical therapy colleagues are huge. Teach patients healthy, healthy home exercise programs, nutrition, diet, the whole, it needs to be uh, a team approach. All right, so this is uh, Roland Becker. He's a famous British osteopath uh, who I've read a lot of his work. He's kind of a mentor of mine. Um, these are kind of the walkaway points I want everybody to leave with. What is osteopathy? How is our approach different? How can we help your patients? Um, where can you find us? And uh, also just a point, anyone can learn osteopathy. Uh, find an osteopath who's willing to teach you. We do didactics as a residency. I'm sure we'd be happy to take anyone in uh, who, who's interested in learning some basic technique that they can help their own patients with. This is the final picture. This is lowering a uh, mountain lion who's all doped up on ketamine out of a tree so we can put a collar on her and let her go. Thank you. So I think we have a question and answer session now. Nobody else has a question. Oh, go for it. Hello, um, great talks. Um, my name is Dr. Mulvihelm with the Montana Family Medicine Residency Program in Billings. And uh, we also have osteopaths in our program. 
And um, <clears throat> one of the things I always challenge them to talk about and share with patients and other providers is outcome data. And I just wondered if you could, you know, address, you know, um, sort of, you know, success ratios, numbers needed to treat, some kind of outcome data on osteopathic treatment for a couple conditions and where there might be more information available to people that don't know a lot about it, particularly when we're screening for patients and trying to describe if I'm going to refer to an osteopath, what is the chance of a improvement in function? You know, I think that's a really good question, and that's always been a criticism. I think, I think one of the reasons that that um, has been difficult to address up to this point is because for number, number needed to treat, you really need a randomized controlled trial, and it's hard to randomize and control a trial with manipulation. There is literally thousands and thousands of studies that are just, this patient goes to an osteopath, how do they do afterwards, and they're almost all positive. Um, there are lots of studies out there. I thought for the purpose of this talk, just being a 20-minute brief overview of osteopathy, that I was going to avoid getting into the minutia of the data. Um, but Cranial Academy, the JAOA, which is the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association, uh, there's a lot of data to back up what I'm talking about. I really wanted this talk to be more of an intuitive talk to understand the philosophy of osteopathy. Um, great information, but can you also tell us how you've helped infants and newborns? So actually, as, as uh, my introductor mentioned, um, I'm going to go to a fellowship next year uh, in neuromuscular medicine, which is osteopathy, uh, so I can get more experience with newborns and infants. What I've seen in some hospitals uh, in the Midwest where every infant is treated, the goals of that are, are birth strains and birth, birth trauma. Uh, a newborn going through a birth canal, we're totally evolved and we've totally, um, uh, our whole structure is made to, to tolerate birth. But there's 5 or 10% of, of newborns that don't seem to thrive. They don't breathe well. They don't feed well. And a lot of those are, are due to mechanical strain that goes through the skull, goes through the neck, goes through the face and the palate. Uh, and if you unlock those, it can make a huge difference on their ability to breathe, their ability to feed, and their ability to grow and thrive. This question is for Christian. I was wondering what the typical time of treatment is uh, that you go through for each of your chronic pain patients. Uh, it, you know, it's quite variable with each patient. Uh, typically, one, once again, I, I give myself six visits to be showing improvement and making functional changes. Uh, I would say Typical with uh, your chronic complex pain patient would be six to ten visits over a six to eight week period of time. Friends, where are your referrals coming from? Well, one, we have direct access in Montana. And physical therapists do. A large portion of my, my personal uh, patients are actually direct access, but we, we are receiving uh, our clinic-wide uh, from family practice, internal medicine, orthopedic doctors. Uh, referrals have changed a great deal in uh, Bozeman, Montana over the years, uh, with the hospitals buying up their most of the physician groups and uh, orthopedic groups opening their own physical therapy practices. Uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult to actually track where are we're consistently getting referrals because it's changed a great deal over the, the years that I've been in practice, the 22 years I've been in practice in Bozeman. Um, but yeah, word of mouth, ph physicians, uh, family practice, internal medicine, orthopedists, but a lot of it is actually word of mouth. Uh, we, I've been there 22 years and patient knows a friend who's got an injury. They tell them, see your doctor and tell them you want to see Christian or go to Great Northern Physical Therapy. 
Um, I have a question. Um, what about patients that are, um, you talked about structure um, affecting function and, and they're interrelated. What about those patients that are uh, missing structure? In other words, missing bones, missing um, cardiology, point, you know, patients that have had open heart. Um, what kind of program is out there for them? I think that's a great question. I think the same principles really apply. Let's just take open heart surgery, for example. The chest wall is going to be rigid. They're going to have a lot of scar tissue around the chest. What is that going to do to the complex machine of the human? It's going to make it more difficult to breathe. That negative change in intrathoracic pressure really drives blood flow, drives lymphatic flow. So my first goal is going to be to open up the chest wall, unlock as much of the scar tissue as I can, get them breathing better, which is going to get all those fluids flowing and improve their health overall. I think if they're missing limbs and other things, it's going to be a multimodal approach. We want to get them the best prosthetics. We want to maximize their function um, within the circumstances that, that are possible. How does osteopathy differ from chiropractic practice? That's a great question. Um, a lot of the principles are the same. I think the technique is really, um, and the focus is, is, is where the nuance uh, lies. I think there's, there's two d general types of treatments. There's direct and indirect. A lot of chiropractors use mostly direct techniques. A lot of osteopaths use mostly indirect techniques, which tend to be more gentle. I think that the overall intention of the treatment are sometimes different. My goal being to facilitate lymphatic flow, nerve flow, breathing, et cetera, as the primary focus. Uh, chiropractic focus is primarily to line the bones up, which is going to have all the same effects. Um, I think depending on the patient, you really just need to find a practitioner who will meet the patient needs. Some chiropractors use amazingly gentle techniques and do great work for their patients. Some osteopaths use more direct techniques, which are better for maybe younger athletes, things like that. I think the key when you're trying to find a practitioner is chiropractic, physical therapy, osteopathy are all procedural based. So you need to find someone who does a good job for your patients. Try a few different people out. See who's getting your patients better. See who your patients like. Well, thank you very much for your attention.